Um, so what do we have in the screen? Let's just zoom in here and have a closer look at the screen. Move my tripod across just to keep it nice and square. So here's your basic screen. Um, it's a two-channel device. Um, it looks like the um, panel one is color-coded to the colors that are on the BNC connector. So you've got a yellow and a green tab on the top there. And if we go across, you'll see we've got a yellow and green tab on the BNC. So they should coincide with channel one and channel two. So um, on the front panel, you've got the button up above each one for channel one. So that's just press button one. Now I'll press button two. You can see we've switched across to the green channel and at the bottom here it now says channel 2 output so looks like you can very easily control which channel you're changing the parameters on. Um, along the bottom here we've got um, the default setup for the channel 1 outputs and it's going to be exactly the same for channel 2 so along the bottom we have the output uh, right now it's turned off so pushing the button will just flip it on and back off again I can hear the relay clicking there if I just be quiet and do it again you'll hear it yourself I hope Okay, we've got the output load, so let's see what that does. We'll just press that. Okay, so here we go. Uh, default is set to 50 ohms on the screen. You can see right there it's saying 50 ohms, and um, looks like we can just default set it to high impedance. So that's good if you're driving um, high impedance loads and you want to have an accurate voltage at that level. So if we go back to the load button again, um, let's see what specify load can do for us. So it defaults to 50 ohms. I'm going to just rotate the uh, knob on the top right hand corner. So okay, we can actually, looks like we can simulate any output impedance up to, let's see how high this thing goes. Uh, 100 ohms, 120. Let's use the, try this left arrow. Oh, yep, okay, the left and right arrow buttons below the knob allows you to select which digit you're playing with. So we're up to one kilo ohm. Uh, two, three, four. I can hear relays clicking in there. Nope, must have been just my mistake. See how high up this goes. Go to the right again. There we go. So 10 kilo ohms seems to be at several 9.99 yeah, so 10 kilo ohms is the maximum output impedance of the channel other than high impedance. So let's just bring this all the way down and see how low it will go. Back down to 100 ohms, 50, 40, 30, 10 ohms, down to, well, I don't know how realistic that is but um, we'll see if we can test that so we're down to a one ohm output impedance here um, I would imagine that this is not actually switching in any physical resistors or anything like that from a low impedance output I would imagine it's actually using the um, constant current or the at least the active output stages of the DACs and um, amplifiers and filters that are after the DACs to uh, simulate the one ohm or whatever impedance you set for the output of this. Now, we're gonna do some other tests later on. Some of the things that I put into my review application was that we would do some fun things like time domain reflectometry, uh, which is used to measure the length of a piece of wire, especially if you don't know the, or have access to the other end of it and you don't know its characteristics, you can actually determine that. Um, also, to um, check some filters and various other things. So um, when we get to that, we'll actually try using this and um, set for things like a uh, cable TV, which is typically 75 ohms, uh, instrumentation, uh, coax, which is usually about 50 ohms, and um, I think from what I remember, twisted pair cables, which are typically about 100 ohm impedance. So um, this would allow us to actually set a correct output impedance so that we minimize our reflections and everything else when we're testing the devices and the cables. So let's just put this back to 50 ohms and we'll go from there. So let's back to the settings. Um, next button is range auto or range hold. Um, 
Okay, we've got the hold light up the top there that's coming on and off, but I don't know if that is... I don't, I'm not 100% sure what that's doing yet, so we'll have to investigate that. Um, polarity, we've got normal and inverted, and if you look at the screen display, it's simply inverting the signal. So I guess if you've got two signals coming out and they're synchronized together from channel 1 and channel 2, um, you can invert one of the channels and do differential pair driving and things like that, I would assume. So that's good. Uh, voltage limits. So here we go. Um, channel 1 voltage limit. Default is uh, plus 5 volts and minus 5 volts. The limiting is currently turned off. So uh, you can turn that on and limit your output. Turn it off. Um, this would be a very, very useful feature if you're driving into, say, um, the clock or some inputs of a microcontroller that's, say, at 3.3 volts or 5 volts, and you want to make sure that you don't put too many volts in there and damage the device under test. Or if you want to limit the amount of um, energy you're putting into a cable, depending on what may be attached to the other end of it. Um, you know, it's very easy when you get carried away and you get into the thick of things to forget what you have attached for a moment and you just crank up the um, output amplitude or you just happen to have pushed the wrong button and you turn the dial and all of a sudden you're putting 10 volts into a 5 volt device. It could be quite disastrous. So if you've got that possibility, um, you can change the voltage limits and put a bit of protection in to make sure you don't damage anything. Um, so that's good. Let's just escape from that. Done button. Okay. Um, so that, I think, done just asserts all the values and comes back, so that's, okay, so the next button is dual channel, so clicking dual channel, what have you got? Uh, frequency coupling on and off, so what are we saying here? Frequency coupled, so ratio channel 1 to channel 2 is 1 to 1, so um, that would allow us to presumably um, have two frequencies set up on channel 1 and channel 2, and as I adjust channel 1 it will track channel 2 in the same way with the frequency um, looks like it's indicating here that the amplitudes and offset so the offset is uh, moving the voltage up and down on the output relative to the height of the signal that you're outputting um, so say if you're doing a 5 volt peak to peak signal typically that would be minus two and a half to plus two and a half an offset um, of two and a half volts on that would allow you to uh, crank up the base voltage to zero volt so that you're actually a zero to five volt signal which of course if you're driving into any um, logic would be um, what you would want. You certainly wouldn't want it to go to minus two and a half volts um, for that kind of scenario so that would be what the offset independent offset settings would let you do. Anyway uh, back to this um, coupling so that was frequency coupling. Let's just turn that back off uh, frequency coupling settings, uh, ratio. Okay, so that's allowing you to, we'll investigate that further, but it looks like you can actually set the ratio between the two different channels for the frequency offset. Um, yeah, it's an offset ratio or an offset in frequency. So let's go back, let's just say done. Uh, amplitude. So the frequencies are independent and the amplitude and the offsets are coupled. So now if you've got two signals in there from channel 1 and channel 2, you adjust the amplitude and it will affect both channels from one setting, which is uh, quite handy, I would imagine. Um, tracking, channel 1, identical, inverted. So uh, frequencies are independent. Uh, that's Oh, okay, that's for the same thing there. Let's just go back. Where's the back button here? Uh, tracking off. So let's just check that again. Tracking identical. Okay, so tracking identical looks like it's making everything on both channels be the same. Um, tracking inverted. So, okay, so that's keeping everything tracking, but one channel is inverted from the other one. If I just say done, if you look at that picture now, it's actually showing you what it's doing, where the yellow and the green channels are exactly the same, it's just one of them is inverted from the other one. Uh, where was I for that? Oh, dual channel uh, tracking. Let's just turn that to identical and look at the picture there. So I don't know whether you can see that on the camera, but the yellow and green lines now are dotted together and it's 
um, showing that they're providing the exact same signal. It looks like channel 1 is the master because if you look at this it's telling me that it's sine wave the output is currently off but that's okay and we've got a 15 ohm 50 ohm impedance and channel 2 is saying the exact same but there's a big warning here saying that it is actually tracking and looking here when I press on channel 2 the only option I get is to set the voltage limits on it and actually to turn the output on and off so that would make sense if we set full tracking let's go back to 1 we get everything available again so let's just go back in here um, tracking let's just turn uh, tracking back off uh, there um, okay so the last button we now have is combine so this looks like you can combine both channels are combined onto channel one so um, I know that when I was first looking at whether to do this review one of the things I noticed was it had the ability to do uh, dual tone um, output so this is where you'd have say a one kilohertz signal mixed with a two kilohertz signal um, and they're both coming out of the same output so an example of this is one of the older phones where when you press the button it actually had dual tone dialing DTFM so it was dual tone frequency modulation dialing um, which allowed you to send down some uh, quite complex set of uh, attributes I guess might be the right word so you know you've got one two three you know, all these buttons on the front panel of a phone well on the on, on this display but also on the on a phone when you press the phone buttons um, you want to be able to portray which number you've sent to the far end but you don't really want to be varying a whole bunch of frequencies so they limited the frequencies but they allowed you to mix two tones um, to indicate which button had been pressed and things so we can have a look at that a little bit later um, that looks like all of the buttons for waveforms on dual channel so let's just go out of that for a moment um, I got something funny still set on here oh combine still on so let's say done alright so we're now back to the normal settings um, so the next thing to look at here what we were looking at after I just pressed button uh, one for button output so this is all about controlling the output so I'm just going to press the waveform button now so that's on the top here the first button we're just going to work our way down to see what these things are doing this is um, basically just I haven't re read the manual at all yet so I'm just going through this to see how easy it is to figure this thing out without actually reading the manuals okay so pressing the waveform button now you can see the um, menus on the bottom of all nicely changed so they've given us a number of selections looks like there's two pages here because we've got a more button that says one of two so we have sine wave um, I just pressed the sine wave button now we have the option to adjust the frequency the amplitude the offset and the phase we'll go through those um, as we start using the individual functions right now I just want to go through the functionality and see what there is so now we have square wave um, again we've got frequency amplitude offset phase and now we have a duty cycle so obviously a default square wave the um, high time and the low time is typically the same duty cycle would allow you to actually change that um, so maybe you could have it high for only 25 percent of the time and low for 75 percent of the time that's actually quite handy if you're using this to drive something like say a servo to test um, uh, positional information you know, like for a radio control car or something like that you can actually uh, emulate the uh, transmission signal that would actually go over the air then be decoded and sent to the servo. They typically use a, I think it's a 1 to 2 millisecond um, pulse width at a certain frequency so we can have a look at that. I think I might even have some servos laying around that we could actually hook up and see what it does. Um, so again same thing um, amplitude offset to the duty cycle. Let's go back to here again. Um, ramp um, so basically half of a triangle wave um, so it's uh, amplitude offset phase and frequency again uh, the difference one here now is symmetry so if we just press symmetry to have a look um, in here um, the default value seems to be a hundred percent which is basically giving us like a sawtooth um, waveform so it's going from a negative value linearly up to a positive value then immediately dropping back to that negative value and then repeating so the default buttons we have here are 100% um, which is what it is to start with 
50% uh, so that basically takes you to your fairly standard triangle wave um, and then 0% basically has um, inverted it to the other way around so it starts off high it linearly ramps back down to negative uh, and then jumps back up to high again so uh, let's just go back to a oh the other one is the symmetry itself as a variable if you notice right in the corner here down at the bottom there's a little um, rotating let me just zoom in on that a little bit so you can see it easier on the button here okay so that would indicate that you can actually adjust the symmetry um, away from the so you got the three default well sorry three yeah three defaults 100 percent 50 percent and zero percent for quick access but um, obviously that's not necessarily what you would always want so um, once you if you just sorry if you just leave it on symmetry I'm going to rotate the um, dial on the top right hand corner and it looks like you can actually just set this to any amount of symmetry that you like um, right down to basically point well yeah, 0.01% of variation. So you have a huge amount of um, granularity on adjusting the symmetry of this, or basically the slopes. Um, whether you, you know from everything from a sawtooth to an inverted sawtooth, and pretty much everything in between, to um, four digits of accuracy. So that's pretty good. Uh, you just go back to 100% and hit back to waveform. Um, okay, so the next waveform we've got is pulse. So let's go in and have a look at this. Uh, okay, so the standard set frequency amplitude offset phase. Um, the extra ones we have now is pulse width. So we press that and it looks like we defaulted to a hundred microseconds. Um, same thing, you can adjust the width very easily with the uh, dial. Uh, down to 10 microseconds currently on uh, the settings we have here going all the way um, up to okay there we go let's that come back so that's gone up to 910 um, microseconds but this default frequency is only at uh, 1 kilohertz at the moment so of course you can't go too high because you're going to have a wider pulse than uh, the, the period of the frequency so it's just not going to work you'd end up with either 100% positive or 100% negative depends on which way you go but if I slow down the frequency and we press the frequency button let's bring that down to uh, how do we bring that down okay here we go oh, next one in yeah so that's pretty easy let's bring it down to um, say a hundred hertz and we'll just go back to pulse width uh, I'd imagine now we can probably take it up yep. now we're able to go way up into the milliseconds 5, 10 yeah so a hundred hertz of course is um, is a point uh, sorry point oh one so 10 millisecond um, period so this is allowing me to take it up to 9.1 um, period. So that's uh, very, very close to almost 100% high time and very, very little low time. So that's. Um, I'm not going to go through all the other ranges way, way up because this thing has a massive range. Um, let's suffice to say that um, it allows you a lot of flexibility as far as the uh, pulse width is concerned. So let me just see if I can. Uh, t uh, just typing directly on the keypad here. So. Uh, if I say 10, we can see at the bottom here now it's given us the option to actually set the uh, base parameter, the period, between nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds, and seconds. So that's um, quite a dynamic range this has got. So I've set that to nanoseconds. That's set a very, very uh, 10 nanosecond pulse there, even though I'm only running at 100 hertz. So that's one very, very wide period. Uh, leading edge time it says is four nanoseconds right now. Let's see if we can change that. So that, oh, they've got the button here that says edge time. So let's go in and have a look at there. Okay, so it's defaulted to leading edge. Um, can we go down? Yep, go down to. Looks like it bottoms out at uh, 2.9 nanoseconds. Uh, trailing edge uh, four down to 2.9 nanoseconds. I think the specification actually said that the maximum rise time of this. 
is 2.9 nanoseconds. So we'll go, I'll check the manual. This is just based on the glossies that I saw before I applied for the review. So we'll verify that. Um, so we've got the button we've just played with leading edge and trailing edge. This um, first button has the option, it looks like, of each and both. So if I press both, okay, it looks like it's tied them both together now so I can vary both the leading and trailing edge slopes um, at the same time together. So that's pretty good. Let's go back to each. Let's just press done. Um, we were just playing with pulse width, so let's look at edge times. Okay, that's just a, looks like it gets us straight there. Even when we're doing uh, sorry, just done edge time. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, done and go back to waveforms. We've done pulse. Let's pick arbitrary and have a look what options we have here. So you've got your sample right now. Arbitrary waveforms is basically where you have a. Um, it's not a waveform that is defined by a simple algorithm like a sine or a cosine or a. Um, a ramp, you know, where you can actually predict it even with a mathematical formula. Uh, arbitrary waveforms on this allows you to actually program um, or select from a number of pre-programmed waveforms uh, to emulate different kinds of signals. Um, so we'll have a look at what this has built in at the, um, for now. I know a few weeks ago I was watching a video that Dave Jones of the EEV blog had done on a Rigol uh, arbitrary waveform generator and it had quite an extensive range of um, pre-programmed arbitrary waveforms that you could select from. Now of course even if this doesn't have the same number of them because it's programmable uh, if they're not there you can hopefully fairly easily create your own and upload them to the device so that you can use them. Obviously it's got the front USB port um, in the unboxing I showed that it's also got a rear USB so there's plenty of different ways in the network connection so you can upload it from software from your PC or from a USB stick so we'll investigate that as we go I've got a few plans for some fun things for that um, anyway let's just look at what we've got here so you've got sample rate which um, will allow us to say how quickly it goes through the arbitrary waveform um, bit pattern so you'll be defining um, the the amplitude and the period between samples. So if you've got four megs, which I think is the default for uh, these devices, then um, you've got four million samples basically that you can fill up with different amplitudes of a signal. And if you're going through at um, 40,000 samples per second, then that would form a, well, it would take quite a long time. I'm not going to do the math in my head right now. Uh, it would take quite a while to go through that sample and actually play it out the output pins, uh, sorry, output sockets. So other settings we have here, you've got the amplitude, um, the offset, which would be the exact same functionality as you've had for the um, standard waveforms that we were looking at a moment ago. Um, phase, again, that's used for just offsetting one output from the second output channel. Um, arbitrary name, I would imagine, is the name that's been given to the pre-stored um, waveform. So in this case, it looks like it's EXP rise arbitrary. So based on the curve that it's showing, this is an exponential curve rise time waveform, uh, and the samples is 250. So, so from the beginning to the end of this, um, the samples will be how many points there are that actually trace out this curve that's on this particular waveform. So in this case, 250 samples. Um, it's <laughs> I'll have to figure out how to do the math on this a bit later. It's not coming to me to mind right off the bat. So let's just go look through the rest of the buttons. We've got amplitude, um, offset. I'm just going to dial that. See what happens. Yes, yeah, so you can see where you're actually. That's um, it's set to 100 millivolt peak to peak signal, and I'm just as I'm adjusting the offset here. There's a uh, white dotted line across the screen here that is indicating uh, its relative position to the waveform. So um, if I take it to zero, that's basically saying, so it's peak to peak 100 millivolts, so you've got 50 millivolts below and 50 millivolts above. So I can take it up to, well, way above the 100 millivolts. I'm making a very, very negative signal here. Um, and if I bring it down, I'm just shifting the offset. Now I'm going the other way. So I'm actually now moving the signal up and up and up. So 
uh, I'm already way over half a volt um, above zero so that 100 millivolt peak to peak signal will be sitting biased in a positive direction let me just put that back to zero and just crank it down here almost there oops too far zero so phase um, offset phase I don't see a phase button on here amplitude offset I guess because it's an arbitrary waveform it's um, <laughs> fixed at zero phase because you're defining what it's doing here so if I just go back to where we were so let's just click the ARBS button and see what we find because that's the one that's the new button here so we've got select ARB which I would imagine allows you to pick one from a you know, predefined set um, edit sorry arbit ARBS in memory so uh, I guess if you've loaded some up they're already sitting in the memory of the uh, signal generator, uh, edit arbitrary file, obviously um, from what I've seen so far this has the capability to actually right inside the device create or edit arbitrary waveforms and uh, then play them back. Uh, import data, uh, let me just press edit, so yeah you've got new and then existing arbitrary waveform, let's just not play with that right now. Uh, import data, um, import data into arbitrary waveform press select file to browse and select a data file for import okay so this looks like you have the ability to import probably from a USB key uh, a waveform into the memory of the device rather than just creating a new one inside um, within the menus that you've got here um, we'll go back to that as well uh, save changes um, that's going to write to the into the device um, any changes you've made to the current waveform that you've been editing so I'm not going to overwrite the default ones right now so I'm just going to say no here um, so let's just go back to uh, select ARB so we've gone through the different menus here we go back and look okay so we have in here um, looks like it's the internal memory file system so we've got um, sorry going up to the top I'm just using the jog dial here um, so it's telling us it's internal memory and we have um, 32, uh, 33x22 ARBs uh, I don't know if you can which button, there's no enter button on here so I'm just trying to see okay there's no arrow to the left right, left or right of that little folder symbol so I'm assuming there's nothing in that folder uh, Agilent presents uh, okay yeah so the two left and right arrow buttons, let me just zoom in here here, these two allow you to expand out a folder if it's got one of these little markers to the side of it um, I should get a pencil or something to point with so right here there's a little marker on the side of these folders that would indicate that there's something inside them so this looks like it's a um, demo uh, 33600A inbox demo looping so we'll go back and have a look at that at the moment let's just keep going down so built in um, yeah, it's already expanded by default. So cardiac. Um, actually, let's just pick some of these right now and just see what they look like. So I would imagine it's going to put them on the screen. Okay, there we go. So cardiac looks like a um, basically a heart rate kind of. If you had a cardiac monitor on you, you would be giving a um, particular waveform shape based on your um, heartbeat. So if you were maybe working on some medical devices, you would want to. Uh, recreate that rather than have to have it hooked up to something so you've got a repeatable and predictable signal uh, let's go back to select ARB pick the next one D Lorentz arbitrary waveform select okay so a fairly classic waveform uh, there let's just pick some more just to have a look uh, exponential fall so we're using exponential rise with the default one okay so that's the exact opposite one uh, we've already looked at exponential rise Gaussian um, waveform, just go in there, so yep, little um, flip, I'd imagine you can just have this thing repeating, it looks like it's set on uh, 50 millivolts peak to peak, but it looks like it's actually sitting on um, zero as well, uh, just based on the fact it's not going below the uh, dotted line which indicates the, the offset level, so let's go back to select ARB, um, go down, um, have or sign, <laughs> what's that one, okay, Maybe have a means half a sine wave because what it looks like here is just half a sine wave. I'll uh, Google that and see what the actual meaning of that one is because that's a new one to me. Uh, let's go back to 
Okay, Lorenz. So, okay, exponential up, exponential down. Um, go back again. This looks like it's negative ramp. Uh, hit the select button. Okay, so that looks like it's very similar to the um, triangle wave we were using before. Um, 250 samples, it's you know, just, well, basically, as you can see there right away, it's just a ramp from a positive 100 millivolts down to a negative uh, 100 millivolts. There seems to be some more, so sync uh, or sin, sin C, so sin C. Um, pulse so um, be very useful for uh, diagnostics and uh, checking response and amplitude response of signals and things uh, what is this one 60.69 so um, yeah it's a very specific amplitude on that one for a reason I'll have to do a quick Google on that as well done uh, see if there's anything more in here uh, documentation folder screen captures uh, settings user files okay so my arb dot barb ah, uh, cheating there that's something I'm going to talk about later for uh, a blog entry so as you can see um, I was playing around with uh, generating waveforms so that's a little uh, teaser for later on let's just say uh, let's go back to uh, select and we'll go back to actually we'll just go back to sine wave because I think that's the end of that one so arbitrary waveforms alright so the next thing we've got more is uh, okay triangle so this looks like hang on, let me just go back there a second uh, waveforms so ramp is no different to triangle on the face of it uh, except that this one doesn't have the option for um, changing its slope rate so it's actually fixed at a 50% slope um, so that's fine uh, was there any more on there go back to waveforms uh, to oh noise okay so this one um, a lot of these new arbitrary waveform generators use a uh, what looks like a fairly simple when you look at the actual diagram but a fairly complicated uh, random noise generator it basically would take years to before it started repeating itself um, so this would be great for testing uh, filters for uh, adding noise to a signal to make sure your noise rejection on a data line was working correctly and you'd be able to test uh, the dropout points by how much noise it could tolerate um, and we'll look at some of the features of that a little bit later on uh, let's go back to waveforms and see what the next one is okay PB PRBS so this one is a pseudo random bit simulation um, I'm not sure if it's the simulation at the end but I'll check the exact acronym for that what this is actually doing is generating um, pseudo random binary patterns uh, so if you were it, it basically is like uh, it's almost a binary counter but it's not quite and it's the time it would take to go from the first patterns counting up through and repeating again is extremely long you would never be running a test in, in realistic terms it would ever get to the point of repeating this so if I go back to waveforms, I just want to go back to the noise one. I actually said before that it was a pseudo-random noise generator. That was actually getting confused with the, the one we've just talked about. So the noise generation, um, it's basically generating random noise. We'll look in the manual to see what it's using um, for the source for that. But uh, you would use this to inject on a sine wave or a data line or something to simulate um, transmission line noise for instance you know if you had a uh, a network cable or an, a, a remote sensor that was running through a noisy environment like a factory or in a car or something like that then you would want to be able to generate noise um, within ranges of what you would pick up in the environment that the target solution is going to be put into so this would allow you to do that and um, because of the fact that you can combine channel 1 and channel 2 as we saw before um, you would be able to 
simulate any of those kind of background noises and, and, and test and validate that your circuits are working well. Let's go back. Was there any more? Uh, oh, DC. So, yeah, I guess that technically isn't a waveform. It's just a DC output level. So, um, this has the capability of, yeah, it's just using the offset to uh, range the output to a fixed level. So, if you were testing an ADC or something like that, um, you'd be able to just set some fixed voltages if you wanted to actually go down. Now, one of the things that I know about this thing is if I go back to just simply sine wave right now, I was saying that you can actually do a DC voltage and just vary the output. But if you look at the frequency that this is able to go to, if I actually um, just type in a number rather than mess with the uh, jog dial button, um, if I just press 1, you can see here the range of frequencies. So you're going from a microhertz, uh, which is basically, you know, 0 0.000, that's a millihertz, 001 hertz. So that is an extremely slow waveform. So you've got microhertz, millihertz, hertz, kilohertz, and megahertz. Um, you know, if you were running at the slowest frequency with these samples, it would probably take you years to run through um, the entire sample set that you had stored into memory if you actually filled it. So that is quite a dynamic range of frequencies that this thing can produce. Obviously because it's microprocessor, um, well it's probably got a um, ASIC or something like that driving this thing, but because it is code control, you can go down to a very, very, very low frequency and of course up to the maximum of 120 megahertz that the device supports. So that is really